There's a lot of buds to press here. Hold on. Wow. Yeah, we got a full house today. I know. We really do. We really do. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, September 6th, 2013. Now, we didn't do a space hangout last week because reasons. Because we suck. <laughs> <laughs> I was at yes, Penny Arcade Expo, gonna... Nicole was at Dragon Con, lots of people were at various cons, we were we all totally super busy. And we're sorry. We were we going to recruit Amy again, but we forgot to tell her. It's so true. How could she know? <laughs> so, um, But thanks for all the really nice things you all said in the comments while you were waiting for us to uh, show up, and we didn't show up, and Do I deeply apologize. Up. Yeah. Mental note, don't make the... Uh, event if you're not going to run the event. I think that's the lesson we that's can really learn here. That's the fail. Yeah, that's where we <laughs> failed. Well, okay, so joining me this week, we've made up for it with a full house, including a new special guest star. So I'm going to start with the new special guest star, which is we've got Eric Berger from the Houston Chronicle. Now I've got the whole set. <laughs> I've completed the whole set. Are we collect, trying to action figures? I, I, collect I all am, I am. I'll trade you Houston Chronicle for a... No. Uh, Eric, welcome. Thank you very much for having me here today. Great. And uh, now I know you've written a big article, a uh, big interview, and we're going to get to talking about that in a few minutes. I'll interview everybody else, and then I thought we'll get into that or the Laddie launch. I... I haven't decided yet. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, so many things. So many. <laughs> you should see my list of stories here. Um, uh, right. So we've got Alan Boyle from NBC. I, 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 I want to say hey. MSNBC, M but it's NBC. <laughs> right. Who appeared at the last minute. Amy Sher Title from Vintage Space. Hello. Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society. David Dickinson from all the things. Everywhere. <laughs> Universe today, that's for good. Jason Major, also from all the things. Well, from the Twitter, from the from the internet. From the lights in the dark. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Nicole Gallucci from uh, CosmoQuest. I left my brain at DragonCon. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> <laughs> and we <laughs> all had, had uh, Dr. Mr. Francis, uh, who was actually at the Laddie launch, but then he had to, uh, it was clearly not going to work. His, He's he, wearing a Cthulhu hat for those yeah, of you who are donated to the do it, do your DIY science zone, which I'll talk about at the end. He's wearing his Cthulhu hat in public for you people. So, yes. Uh, the other thing that's new is we, I don't know if people have noticed, but we've got high definition. So I don't know how many of you have actually clicked the high definition button. I have, and I can see the difference. <laughs> It's clearly in higher definition. I, you know. I, 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 think, I think you better have me in low def. <laughs> low def. I'm going to go back to low def. The news stories this week are going to be that much better. You know, they're going to be yeah, 12 percent more definition to all the space news stories. <laughs> well, it's less of an issue with this, but it's definitely with with the uh, virtual star party when we're showing off little smudgy bits in the screen. Ha being able to sh have it in high def, I think, is going to be great. So keep uh, this smudgy bit on our laptop. <laughs> <laughs> You know? We're not always the silly guys. I swear. No. All right. Well, let me just break down some of the stories, and then uh, so people can know what what's on my mind right now. So we've got, uh, like I said, this uh, very interesting interview from from Eric, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, the launch of Laddie tonight, which if you haven't, if you live on the east coast of the United States, go see it. Uh, now, Alan, I put this for you, but I'm not sure if you did work on this. That that Mars life might not come from Earth or Earth Mars. Oh yeah, connection. I could talk okay, about good. that. Okay, sure. good. You could talk we'll about that. We'll make something sure. up. Okay, great. Um, and also Spaceship Two. Do you want to talk about Spaceship Two? Sure. Okay, great. Uh, we hadn't talked about this beforehand, so um, we're going to talk about the uh, Venus Moon conjunction, uh, the death of Deep Impact slash Epoxy, uh, the Europa Clipper mission, uh, the. Kepler repurposing, which I'm calling the Keplerpissing. <laughs> uh, the limit to supermassive black hole growth, uh, a corkscrew jet, M87. We, we missed two, two weeks, so we've got lots to talk about. Whew. Okay, well, actually, you know, let's start with the, the Laddie. Oh, one last thing. I know I'm, I'm so out of practice. Uh, if you wish, you can make comments, questions, feedback, and uh, at any point during this broadcast. So all you have to do is just go to, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can make comments there. If you're watching this on the event page on Google+, you can make a comment there. Uh, anywhere else, we'll probably not notice it. So watch it on YouTube or on the event page on Google+. That'll be safe. And then we'll try to incorporate your questions. I'll pass them back to our panel of uh, experts, and we'll 
and we'll go from there. Uh, okay, well, let's talk about the Laddie launch because I think that's the big news, and that's going to be happening tonight. Yeah, that's uh, that's so. going to be a, a historic launch because that's going to be the first time they've done a they've done low Earth orbit launches from Wallops. They've done a lot of suborbitals. They've done the Antares launch with Cygnus. This will be the first time they do a moonshot or anything beyond low Earth orbit from Wallops. Uh, Laddie is the Lunar Atmosphere Dust Environment Explorer. And it's going to take about 25 days, I believe it is, to make it to the moon. It's going to do, uh, it's launching tonight at about 11.27 uh, Eastern time. It's going to be visible from Boston all the way down to North Carolina. It's going to be heading out almost due east right out of Wallops. So, uh, they, they, it's, and it's a night launch, so it will be visible for hundreds of miles around. I mean, I see night launches here from the Kennedy Space Center. 100 miles away. I live in Tampa on the other side of the Florida Peninsula, and they're very... I saw Kepler when it launched at night, and I followed it right through staging and right through separation with Binox, so this will definitely be an interesting one to watch, and there's a NASA social. Dr. Francis is there right now. I'm going to try to catch it. Yeah, I'm going to try to catch it, see if yeah. uh, uh, looking um, looking south from my position uh, in Rhode Island, I can see, hopefully, uh, when it lights up the third stage. Yeah, there's uh, the the one Canada.com article I wrote that I, I put in the comments. There's a footprint map on there, uh, and it's on space weather. And there's one on Universe Today. That footprint maps all over. Uh, from you're in Rhode Island, Jason, I think it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do south probably about a minute after launch. You'll probably I, I would carry Binox. You might be able to watch it through separation and everything. So. Amy, will Amy be able to see it? Uh, it's going to be right on the. She's right on the edge of the visibility cone, looking at the map. But it, it would be worth looking. I would get I would driving, Amy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> drive toward there. I think you're mid. You're, yeah. you're mid North Carolina, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, I don't have so. a good map of the state in my head, so we'll go. Delaware with bound. North Carolina is a big state. East to yeah. west, it's a big state. Yeah. But uh, Delaware. I I, I didn't know. North, right? Yeah. I didn't know um, that the Minotaur 5 rocket that's launching that, those are converted ICBMs. I heard Dr. Francis, they were talking about that on Twitter last night. I did not know that. I believe they're converted Peacekeeper missiles. It looks yeah. like one. So Dur During one of the press conferences, they were saying that this had to be launched from Virginia because that was one of the few, uh, few spaceports that was approved by the treaties to, to uh, launch these things. Oh, so interesting. Interest did not know that. It's interesting. Because I mean, you know, if you're going to do a moonshot, you really want to go closer to the equator, right? You want the big delta V to get out to the moon. So, yeah, to launch from from Delaware, right? That's this one's taking its time. It's off Virginia, but it's pretty close to that area. Yeah, Th yeah. this one's going to be. It's like a lot of the the recent uh, like Grail and a lot of those missions where it's going to take almost a month to get out to the moon. It's going to do a looping elliptical orbit around the Earth. Uh, a bunch of us amateur sat spotters are probably going to try to see it when it reaches. I'm not sure what the per perigee point is going to be, but it may be a binocular object. And it's going to generate extra hardware with stages and fairings and everything else in orbit to, to track. So I'll, I'll be tracking that once it goes up, trying to, to see what the sighting opportunities for it are. I don't know what they're going to do about... Uh, Wallops has a problem with boat congestion as far as uh, the... the the legendary boat in the box. Every time, every time it seems like they want to do a launch out of there, they always have problems with boat traffic and keeping their launch corridor clear. So I don't know how much... The weather, I've heard, is about 95% go, so the weather is good tonight. But unlike down here on the Florida Space Coast, you've got uh, up north in the northeast, you've got a lot more congestion as far as boat traffic they have to deal with. I know they send the NOTAMs out and they send out the notifications, but somebody always ends up driving a boat into the launch cone somehow. <laughs> want to get closer, want to see that thing up close. Now, um, I know some of you have some different takes on the story as well. So, uh, Nicole, you've got some uh, citizen science uh, opportunities for people, right? Yes, so Laddie has a couple of ways that you can actually get involved in the mission. Uh, it is specifically looking at the exosphere of the moon, the uh, in, the uh, dust on the surface, the particles around it. It's not a true atmosphere. It's what we call exosphere. Uh, and there are different ways you can get involved in that. And the easiest way is to use an app called Meteor Counter. If you are out anytime at night, uh, bring your phone with you, bring your smartphone with you, turn the brightness down, obviously. But uh, you can use a uh, Meteor Counter app on Android or, or iOS devices, and that will let you um, inform the database of how many meteors are coming through the Earth's atmosphere, which gives a rough estimate of how many tiny objects may also be hitting the moon at the same time. They'll be looking to see uh, when these impacts occur and uh, how that throws dust up into the exosphere um, of, of the moon. 
And if you have an 8 to 14 inch telescope, uh, there's a, a further opportunity for observing the moon and actually helping. Uh, if you're taking images or video of the moon, they are looking for people to monitor the moon for impacts while, again, while the Laddie spacecraft is, is doing its observations. So I will include a, a link to, to that in the comments right after I'm, I'm done here. Um, this is uh, through the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. So if you're already involved in that group, you have the info you need. Uh, and finally, um, there's a, an opportunity for students to uh, build little uh, radio telescopes, little radio monitoring systems to track the uh, the carrier signal from the spacecraft and actually do some Doppler measurements and learn a little bit about radio communications as well. Um, and that's using the um, the uh, a program through the Goldstone uh, Radio Telescope. Mm -hmm. So I will include a link to that in the comments, but if you just Google Lottie and go to the link that says ways to get involved, there are all different ways that you can actually participate in the science, help the science for this mission. It's always weird to think of the moon having an atmosphere. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Everything's <laughs> just, got an exosphere. It's something we usually just usually ignore because it's yeah. just so basically not there. Mercury, too. We've got Messenger yeah. exploring yeah. the exosphere of Mercury while it's there. Now, Amy, you had some additional information as well, right? Yeah. Um, so, the as we've said, the LADEE mission is the, the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. It's looking at this sort of weird Apollo-era mystery of why some astronauts saw, you know, how you see sun rays kind of going through dust on Earth. They saw something similar at the, the lunar horizon. Um, but there's also a demonstration mission, um, or a demonstration technology thing on this mission um, called the Lunar Laser Communications Demonstration. And this is going to use lasers to talk back and forth at... Um, a much higher data transfer rate than typical radio communications, which is LADEE's um, primary primary method of communication because it's you know tried and true. Um, so the the laser tele telecommunications. I'm just trying to find the exact data transfer rate, but it's something like billions of bits per per minute or maybe it's second. Um, but what what it's basically going to do? It's going to run for 30 days, so it's going to take LADEE 30 days to get to the moon, and then it's going to kind of hang out. And this LLCD package is going to turn on, and it's going to run its 30-day mission to sort of prove that it can actually um, communicate between the Earth receiving stations on the Earth. There's one at JPL, one at Ames, and one in the Spain, ESA has one. Yeah, in Spain. It's, it's in, I think it's in Tenerife, actually, which I guess is technically part of Spain. Um, or not technically, it just is part of Spain. Um, so Wait. the transfer rate, um, there we go, hundreds of millions of bits of data per second from the Earth to the Moon, which is the equivalent to streaming more than 100 HD television channels at the same time. That is so much more data than we currently have coming back. Um, so what, what this means to kind of open up, I mean, this is a demonstration. This isn't going to sort of change the face of this mission, but this does open up a future where we could have really fast streaming images from way out anywhere in space. I mean, there's always going to be a light time delay and stuff, but you can get much higher resolution image and much more data coming back much faster. And there's there has been some some talk, NASA's kind of hopefully looking forward to a future where it could this kind of technology could actually transmit 3D high definition video signals back to Earth in so, you know near-ish real time that could sort of create like a telepresence for humans operating a, a rover on an asteroid or on a, a, the moon or on Mars or something, which would be really cool because that would really change the sort of human-machine relationship as we explore space with robots because we can't go there yet ourselves. So this is going to be neat. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. It's cool That's because <laughs> one, of, one of the major issues that missions have a lot is this thing called data volume. They have to work within these constraints that they only get so much data they can download at once, and often, especially on Curiosity on Mars missions, they have way more data than they can send back. So finding new ways to send back data at higher rates is a huge, huge step forward that you can see real benefits from. So that's actually, to me, one of the most exciting things about Laddie. Yeah, you can a, imagine some future where there's like a sophisticated internet, space internet relay system where, you know, these probes are using these much higher, faster communications methods and you and they're sending information to whoever's closest and relaying information and it's robust and it's got lots of, you know, repeatable nodes and stuff. Oh, that would be great. There's an yeah. optical SETI program out there that looks for maybe there's an idea that aliens may be communicating that way already by high-speed laser pulses. 
Yeah, the society uh, funds is a partial funder to that. If I can just jump in on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know what I said beforehand. Uh, Kate, wanna, <laughs> oh, wanna... so can I add one more thing about Laddie? Because uh, I, I don't want to not bum people. I, I do want to bum people out again. That's what I do. Has it been uh, canceled? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, it is the last lunar mission uh, that NASA has on the books. This is the end of what's called the Lunar Quest program, which was started back about 10 years ago when they, NASA was revamping to go to the moon in a big way. This is the, the quiet, ending with a, a quiet uh, little mission here. And that's no more missions to the moon on the books. So this is the, the closing the closing the chapter on uh, era of lunar exploration for NASA. Is, is and Dan Lat officially on the books, the Dark Steve? Energy Reionization Explorer? No. Okay. Which one? The Dark Energy Reionization Explorer. Is that uh, I don't know what that is. That's okay, a, that, that's a it's a mission to send a radio telescope in orbit around the moon to do oh. super low frequency. Um, oh, well, that's an astronomy program, though, right? Yes, but the yeah. plan is to go to the moon and use it as the base for the telescope. Okay. I, wasn't sure I don't know if that's on the books. See. Judging by uh, that everything is basically paying for James Webb Space Telescope and Sophia right now, um, probably not, but I'd have to double check. But in terms of lunar exploration missions... In terms of studying the moon. Itself, yeah, this you. is the last one. On and the right side... It uh, will uh, end with a bang, right? Because it's after 100 days, it's um, it's going to impact. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, you, or bang or lack thereof, there, really. There was an interesting bit on uh, NASA Science News. I didn't realize they said since Laddie is solar-powered that the lunar eclipse on April 15th of next year may signal the end of the mission once it passes into the Earth's shadow. Mm. I'm surprised it doesn't have enough battery power to last through a lunar eclipse, but that's what they were saying in the article. <laughs> so it's... Uh, on the bright side, there's a Chinese mission to send a lander and a rover to the moon that's supposed that's to right. take off later yeah. this year. December 1st. And that's actually one of the reasons why Laddie was kept on the books, because this tenuous lunar atmosphere is so tenuous that doing things like landing on the surface actually utterly disrupts and alters the, the lunar exosphere with all They're of the saying, exhaust. Yeah. This gives us a chance for looking at it in a pristine state because we yep. haven't been. I think Grail was the last thing to crash into the moon last December. So, okay, well, I'm gonna we gotta move on because we got so many stories and uh, so little time. And so I want to move on to to Eric who uh, has joined us this week for the first time, hopefully not the last. And uh, so Eric, uh, you work at the Houston Chronicle and you had a sort of exclusive interview this week. So can you give us a bit of background on this? Sure, there are. Uh... In Houston, obviously, where I'm at, there are a lot of people uh, from the Apollo era, veterans, and uh, so guys that worked on this. And, and one of the most eloquent is a guy named Chris Kraft, who uh, you know was the first flight director at uh, JSC, uh, went on to become a senior manager during Apollo, and um, then uh, you know was director of JSC for about a decade. And so he's been around, and and. These guys live for following what's happening with the manned spaceflight program. And so, you know, I, I talked to Chris periodically, and, and about two weeks ago I decided to go down to his home and, you know, to sit down with him for a couple hours to get his current, you know, views on the, the space program. And, you know, a lot of these guys have, have always wanted to go back to the moon, and they supported the Constellation. Um, and, and what I liked about the, the interview with Chris is, is, you know, even though he's 89 years old, he's still very eloquent, very sharp, and, um, you know, was right on point when I was asking him questions. And the concern a lot of these guys have is, you know, Congress, the White House, and NASA talk about how they're building this rocket and this spacecraft. They're going to take us beyond, you know, low Earth orbit. What, what NASA doesn't usually tell you is that there are no payloads being built for these missions. There are no, you know... Uh, clearly defined goals or, or missions outside of maybe going to an asteroid, but a lot of people in Congress don't like that. And, you know, what what these guys are concerned about is that the missions or the, the rocket that they're building is a very large rocket, so you can launch everything you would need in a single launch to get it in orbit and then just go from there is, is really unsustainable because they were around in the 1970s, early 1970s, when NASA went from having 5% of the budget to you know, less than 5% of the budget significantly. And they had to, they had a, they had one of these rockets. It was called the Apollo rockets. Um, they were too expensive to maintain. They were too expensive to fly unless you were devoting a significant chunk of the nation's resources to the space program. So they're wondering how, now that we're building these rockets again, how this program is going to be sustainable at a time when NASA is seeing a budget freeze 
and certainly isn't looking for an increase um, anytime soon. And so what they what they wonder, and this this sort of this dovetails a lot with what I hear from engineers at JSC who I talk to, Johnson Space Center. They say we've got all this private capacity to launch stuff into space. We've got the Ariane rocket from France. We've got the Deltas. We've got Atlas's uh, SpaceX is building Falcon 9s. Now these are not super heavy lift rockets. You can't get everything you need up in in, or, in orbit. But you know you could launch a spacecraft. You could launch fuel. You could launch you know a, li a living module. And you could put it all up there in orbit and then combine it just like you did the International Space Station and go from there. And then that way NASA doesn't have to spend a decade building a rocket, billions of dollars to build something that maybe isn't sustainable in the first place. And you're never really going to have reliability uh, for these rockets. And so, you know, Chris and I talked a lot about a lot of those things, but but the basic concern he had was that, you know, that the, the, the trajectory that the human spaceflight program is on is not sustainable. Um, and because there seems to be more of a focus on placating all of the centers, like building the rocket at, at Marshall Space Flight Center because you know they're important senators from that state and keeping the constituencies happy happy around the country when in fact if you're doing that it's maybe more about NASA being a jobs program than actually accomplishing something and so that he, he was really eloquent in the way he talked about it and so I did the interview and did a version that ran in the paper and then I put a longer version on my blog and that got passed around quite a bit over the last week it was a uh, it was a really a really great interview, uh, Eric. You know, I, I I passed it around myself uh, on Twitter and you know other places. But um, you know, hearing hearing what these what these guys who helped really build NASA and 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 make it what it is today, um, or or at least make it what it was, uh, and and you know see see their take on it. You know, and that, the unsustainability was really the part that that hit me the 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 hardest, or the real the real underlining part of that article was that you know yeah you can build this, but can you keep it going? I mean, is it going to be is yeah. it going to be the this this thing that sinks it? Or I mean, I think we're reporting on this. You know, we've been living this for the last. You know, I've been working on this for 14 years now. Uh, you know, Alan longer, but we just report on this stuff bit by bit as these these bold plans come up and then they just can't sustain them and they have to kind of scale them down and take them apart and and now you just I like you just see the same story again and again and again we're going to build this big thing we're going to the moon but you know it's not going to be sustained you know it's not going to keep going like I just yeah I mean I really share that same frustration but then I'm a Canadian so I have we have, vote we have a very schizophrenic space program kind of you have an arm <laughs> but it's strange because you get you get that on the one hand you get that right and then on the other hand you get all this really exciting stuff that's happening with the private space you know with what's happening with SpaceX and Elon Musk and what's happening we're going to talk about Spaceship Two in a second which is orbital, but still um, and so you've got these sort of these weird things you've got on the one hand you've got this this NASA machine that really it's very political you've got to keep all fifty states involved in the process and. These guys build rockets, and those people build boosters, and so on. And that, and that, trying to keep all those people happy and sustain it—that's, it's so tough. And you want to be excited about it. You see the progress, you know, little bits by bits. That uh, you know, they do the t testing on the Orion uh, MPCV, and you know, doing splash testing, and and you know, things are happening. It's getting built, but in the back of your head, and amidst all the excitement, it's like, it, what's going to happen after you know, once it's all there, and is it going to become part of something big, real, that's going to head towards the future. Well, that's kind of the irony. If you, if you think about the first test of Orion, they're not going to be testing it on a NASA rocket. They're going to be launching it on a Delta IV. And mm -hmm. so you're going to have these commercial rockets are already going to be able to carry <laughs> the spacecraft into space. So why, you know, why does NASA need to build its own super rocket? And if you sort of drill down to that, that essence, and the answer comes back, well, because that keeps a lot of centers happy, a lot, a lot of constituencies happy. It's, it's sort of you realize, you know, what you get some wagging. Become. Yeah, you get some some <laughs> some dog wagging going on. Yeah, I mean, I wonder what'll happen. Like, if you see the kinds of tests that SpaceX is doing with the Dragonfly and you know, sort of the Grasshopper and things like that, where you're going to get these, you know, really radical concepts in in rocket building, rocket engineering. I wonder if at a certain point they're just going to go, okay, fine. We'll just buy cargo on SpaceX and call it a day. Well, it would be interesting to see if that happens. And one of the funny things is the um, I remember clearly there was a news conference about uh, 
a year ago and where they were talking about the first dragon to go up to the International Space Station. And the question was asked, well, how much would this spacecraft have cost if NASA had developed it? And the honest answer from the NASA engineers is it would have cost eight to ten times as much. Think about that. Well, let me, can I just jump in there? Two things I want to just add to this, which is um, that NASA is also paying SpaceX to make these rockets, too. Don't, let's not forget that, the, you know, th this is a private industry being supported by the established government agencies. So this is a nice combination of what can be done to make it more efficient. And then the second was that NASA didn't want to make the SLS. They wanted to cancel this back in 2011, and Congress forced them to make this new rocket, and it forced them to use reconfigured shuttle pieces to do exactly what Fraser was talking about, to maintain the shuttle workforce that has been in existence for over 30 years. And this is what happens. I think that a lot of this is a consequence of when the public generally does not stay, a, have much of an attention to the space program, it becomes this pot of money that can be used for jobs programs, specifically when Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama has very powerful senators representing that state. They want to keep those jobs in Alabama. They want to keep them doing what they've been doing. So you end up with things like SLS, which are this kind of Kafka-esque, you know, plan to make this giant rocket with no purpose that and no money to give it a purpose. And so a lot of this is because of the lack of public participation or awareness of the space program. You know, it was funny. When, when the shuttles were still flying and people were asking me, you know, how do you feel about them canceling the space shuttle? And I, and I said for a while there, I said, they're not going to cancel the space shuttle. Like, even though they say they're going to cancel the space shuttle, they're not going to do it because, because they're going to have to hand tens of thousands of people their, you know, their pink slips. They're going to have to lay off all these people, and they're not going to do that. It's going to be terrible for the politicians, and they're just they're going to figure out some way to keep the shuttle program going. And I didn't think of this. But they did. This is what they thought of was to just shift this workforce over and go with the you know with the new version, the new super rocket, using reconfigured shuttle parts and keep everybody working and then keep all the politicians happy and and it's definitely not ideal. So well, that's yeah. that's the real that's the real thing that, that bugs me about this is you had you had some effort to change NASA in 2011 and then Congress got involved and at the end of the day Congress came to a plan with the Obama administration that said okay we're going to build. We're going to build a spacecraft. We're going to build this giant rocket. And everyone came out singing Kumbaya. And NASA was left holding the bag and having to implement this program, which was unsustainable. And, and their leadership, frankly, can't come out publicly and say that this is a bad plan, even if it was a bad plan or an unsustainable plan. But if you talk to people below the top level administrators at NASA, you know, privately, and Chris made this point as well, they'll tell you, <laughs> you know, th this is not, this is not a program that we feel real good about. So what's the inevitable outcome for this then? It's going to be a constellation, or uh, the, the program's canceled. It's another constellation canceled in three or four years. And new president comes in and they, they go Clean back off. and wring their hands and, and try to come up with a new plan. And by that time, Mars One will be on its way to yeah. the red planet. <laughs> it's 2018, yeah. But the what about all those workers? They're still there. I mean, their budget's still there for all the workers. So, I mean, you know, the what are they going to have to there? A lot of the contractors are there. Well, Eric, did they lay, they did lay off a fair number of contractors at the end of the shuttle program, right? So sure, they laid off a lot at KSC, and they laid off you know several thousand here at JSC. Some of whom have, have been able to transition so, back into programs. So but yes, we're we're kind of in the midst of a transition. It might kind of continue on a downward slope, and uh, you know we see that in the media industry too. That there, it's it transitions can be pretty painful. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't flush everything down. Except for NBC, you guys will be great. Mm, well, we're having a transition too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to butt in and say the NASA education and outreach is also that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In danger of losing everybody. Everybody we're, that works on these programs is gonna is is looking at having their budget zeroed, and we're still not sure what the final decision is. And I mean, that's something that hits all of us really close to home. I mean, so much of what we depend on for our information, for the kinds of of articles and stuff that we write, the teacher resources that are being put out. Yeah, it's, it's all it's gonna be devastating. The events that happen. It was too bad. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that must have just been a real treat, though, Eric. Had you know to go down and sit with a legend of of space exploration and just get his insights. I mean, I'm amazed they were able to, you know, kick you out of the house at the end. Like it must have just been like more stories, please. 
<laughs> yeah, Chris. Chris is a good guy. I've kind of known him pretty well over the last five years. Um, you know, started out with the talking to him about the Apollo anniversaries. But but you know, these guys are there's 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 a lot of them who are you know actively engaged and and sort of still closely following the space program. They they have strong they have strong opinions, and they're not they're not happy with what's going on. Yeah. It's interesting too. One of them, he was lamenting the loss of Neil Armstrong, not just because he was a friend, but because Neil was probably certainly the most weighty voice in saying, "Hey, wait a minute, you know, I don't think what we're doing here is the right thing." And and, and losing Armstrong, and you know, frankly, as these other older astronauts die off, they, they, these guys who you know feel empowered to speak out, I think we're really losing not only an understanding of what happened 30 or 40 years ago, but people who are willing to speak out. I thought of this when Neil Armstrong passed, you know, within a decade or so we may live in an era where no one living has walked on the moon, and that's going to be, right. yeah, we're just going to wake up one day and realize that. It's going to be kind of sad. Alright, well let's, let's move on. Um, so we've got two stories out of the 12 that I have here. Uh, all right, so let's talk about... Uh, so I, actually, I want to talk about this panspermia story with you, Alan. Oh, okay. Uh, so the, the whole idea is um, that where did life on Earth come from? And so I'll try to boil this down to 30 seconds. Uh, that uh, the idea that was put forth by this chemist named Stephen Benner is that life came from Mars because of the chemistry involved, that uh, billions of years ago Earth was too wet for some of the some of the chemicals that would be required to kind of stabilize the chemistry of life to arise and he focuses on boron and molybdenum and so he's saying that boron and molybden molybdenum uh, could have arisen on Mars first because it was a drier planet at that at that time the conditions were actually better on Mars early in its lifetime based on what what uh, people are seeing from the Curiosity results and then it somehow was blasted into space on a meteorite and fell to Earth mm -hmm. and that's what got things going on Earth. So um, uh, other folks say that this is a nice story but uh, really uh, it's still a bit of a stretch to, to think that the conditions couldn't have arisen on Earth and we could have homegrown life. It's a nice thing to think about that we're all Martians but uh, and uh, you could do further research to kind of nail this down a little bit more, but for the time being, it's a, a little bit more than, it's not much more than a nice idea. But right. the guy who is proposing it is a serious guy, so that's, that's a plus. This is no kook. He's, he's the guy who kind of called out the people who are saying that there could be arsenic-based life, and so you do have to pay a little more attention. Right, I mean, the, the concept of panspermia has been around for Three a long time, decades. and yeah. yeah, and and this understanding this mechanism where you get asteroids smashing into Mars, blowing up debris into space, and then the rocks making the journey over into, you know, and impacting the Earth, and, and the fact that microbes can survive every portion of that journey mm -hmm. is amazing. Um, but it's this extra little bit, right, that there are these right, chemicals right. that were the more chemistry. appropriate on Mars than they were on it, Earth it, at that right time. It, it really focuses on what were the conditions for life to arise on the early Earth as opposed to the early Mars. Mars was smaller, maybe it was a fast, uh, I don't know, a fast learner when it came to the chemistry of life, but unfortunately it was so small that it lost the properties that were conducive to life, like a global magnetic field to, to save it from solar radiation. So, what, what role did those elements play? Those aren't organic elements. There's right, something but, I'm uh, missing in there, I think. Uh, right, I and, and Benner calls it the tar paradox, is that if you just put organic compounds together and then introduce energy, all you get is this oily sort of tar, that you need uh, boron and molybdenum to stabilize the, uh, the structure okay. of, okay, of DNA and RNA. There are borites in RNA, for example, that help to stabilize that chemical structure. And at that point, too much water is actually uh, against, you know, against life. So that right. has to happen first, and then the water. Right. The the idea is that uh, boron uh, minerals don't form well when you got a lot of water. And the thinking was that Earth was covered with water at uh, an early point in its development and was not a conducive environment for creating those minerals. So there you have it, sports fans. Awesome. <laughs> that was fast, to the point, well debunked at the same time. I love it. Okay. Uh, Deep Impact, dead? 
Casey? Uh, maybe. Uh, Deep Impact, which uh, a few years ago released a big impactor onto uh, Comet to see what came out of it, has been repurposed as this mission called Epoxy to look at uh, other comets around the solar system. Uh, the, we saw a note on their mission site uh, just posted saying that they haven't been able to contact the spacecraft since August 8th, which is a bad sign. They've been checking in on it periodically. It's been kind of in a sleep hibernation mode. It hasn't been doing too much. Um, and then the latest we've seen is on a Nature blog saying that the mission, the spacecraft, is actually spinning out of control, and they think that that was introduced by a software glitch uh, from a previous command uploaded a few months ago. So... They're working on stabilizing the spacecraft. Uh, it's running on battery. The battery only lasts so long, so if they can't get it to point its solar panels towards the sun, the mission is effectively lost. Uh, we don't know anything more than that. This was the last update we've had as, uh, two days ago. So we'll see. Right, and I think you know what we reported on on Universe Today, and I know a lot of other people did as well, is the fact that it was going to be tasked to take some photos of Comet Ison. Yes, yes. And... Right. And now it can't. It's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> Do, yes, the math, Do the math, people. <laughs> Wake up. Oh. Wake I, up, I, people. I, I hear about it on Twitter or in emails nearly every day where people are like, so where, where are the Comet Ison photos promised from Deep Impact? So I'm probably going to hear about it every, probably hourly now. <laughs> like, if you don't think that we're overblowing this or whatever, go to YouTube, do a search for Ison, and it is a gong show on YouTube. Right <laughs> like, I am not kidding. It is madness. The kinds of things that people are saying about Ison, what, what it is, what's, what it's going to do. It's the, the whole, what they're saying isn't really, it's kind of like 2012 meets Hillbop, like just basically rehashed again. They're not even being original, so it's, it's the, the same <laughs> if stuff. If you're going to have a before. conspiracy theory, <laughs> at least make up a... Yeah, do something new. But, I mean, if, if Ison does turn out to be the comet of the century, the comet of the millennium, then it's just going to multiply all the stuff by 100 until it's Pretty gone. Much. And so we are going to be batting down the hatches. I'll just enjoy the show. You just enjoy the show. You you are going to be working hard. <laughs> <with it. laughs> I expect daily updates on, nope, it's still just a really pretty comet. It should be within magnitude, 10th uh, magnitude, like a binocular object by mid. October, I believe it is. So we still have about another month. We're getting. Cl I'm so excited. This is. I think it's around 12th magnitude. Last there, there's this whole debate about what magnitude because it just came out from behind the sun last month. So now amateurs are starting to pick it up again. So, but did it survive the trip around the sun? I know we said we were talking about a well, Now that, suddenly we're talking just, about Ison, but that's just from our perspective. It still hasn't reached perihelion yet. Perihelion's not till late November. From our pers actually, the the more appropriate thing to say is we went behind the sun from Comet Ison's vantage point. Right, so okay. It's, uh, it's coming back around now. So, Casey, just to kind of get back on focus here, uh, we don't know if we can get it, if they can recover it? Yeah, the, we are waiting. We don't know anything for sure. NASA's being pretty tight-lipped about it. I'm sure we'll hear something within the next week or so if they've at least tried or had any success whatsoever. So hold your breath. Maybe don't. It might be too long. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the uh, the Kepler repurposing with uh, Jason, the Keplerpissing. Yeah, well, speaking of repurposing spacecraft, um, so earlier this year, I think it was May, uh, the second of four, well, this, this, Kepler has uh, uh, aiming wheels. It has uh, these precision wheels that, that allow it to basically look, stare at uh, the same bunch of stars for a long period of time and, you know, catch uh, exoplanets passing in front of them. Um, last year, one of the wheels uh, stopped working, and this past May, another wheel stopped working. So they weren't able to get it back up online. They tried. They, you know, it failed. Um, so now Kepler's going to be working in this... Right now it's in a safe, you know, kind of like a safe, uh, uh, safe mode, but they're, they're petitioning scientists and researchers to come up with, well, what can we do with Kepler now that it's in this two-wheel mode? Um, because, I mean, it's, it's, it's still a working uh, space telescope. It's just, you know, it doesn't quite have the precision to stare at a bunch of stars and find uh, passing exoplanets like it, like it used to. Um, so one of the interesting papers I ran across uh, this past week suggested that, well, maybe Kepler can still find exoplanets if it looks at smaller stars. And what they're, what they're uh, looking at is uh, 
pointing Kepler towards a, uh, a group of white dwarfs that are known within the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And basically watching them, because they're smaller, any potential exoplanets that pass in front of them would effectively block out uh, a good percentage of the light that comes from these white dwarfs. And, um, and, and the white dwarfs would have a habitable zone. So, you know, that, that are like, you know, tight in towards it. So, so basically, if there's any planets, exoplanets, around these white dwarfs, even if they're Earth-sized, they would blot out most of the light, uh, potentially even finding objects as small as the moon if they're uh, orbiting those planets or in orbit around those stars. So they're proposing that we take Kepler, aim it somewhere else, and look at maybe about, uh, I think it was about 10,000 white dwarfs, and seeing if there's any uh, potential Earth, Earth-like exoplanets orbiting those stars. Um, I mean, it sounded like a really interesting topic. So uh, there's a, uh, in fact, I'll I'll throw a I'll throw the link to the story up. Uh, so people can put it in the um, can put it in the. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, the idea that we can keep we can keep looking for exoplanets with Kepler uh, is great. You know, it's not yeah, it's not going to be staring at these big main sequence stars like our own sun and finding tiny tiny little exoplanets in front of it. It can actually find, you know, earth-sized planets around smaller stars. And if it does find earth-sized planets around smaller stars, I mean, that's not the holy grail that we've talked about, but it is still pretty great. I mean, you can start to get a sense because those white dwarf stars used to be sun-sized stars. Right. That's telling you that that maybe what the percentage of those kinds of stars would have their planets, or even if they don't find them, then that's interesting too, because it means that a certain percentage of these of these stars, as they go through the red giant phase, blow off these planets or gobble them up, or who knows what happens. So wh whichever way you go, I think that's absolutely fascinating. I think that's a perfectly acceptable use for Kepler. I right. Approve. And there's also and there's also a lead in there for the James Webb because they're saying that if they uh, find these if they find say an Earth-sized uh, exoplanet in the habitable zone of a white dwarf star, then James Webb's when it launches and it's out there, it can look at that exoplanet and see if it can find any biomarkers like uh, like molecular oxygen, which is what we uh, you know we use to live every day right now. Thanks, oxygen. Um... All right, well, I'm going to move on. So, actually, this is great. So, Alan, can we talk about the uh, the Spaceship 2 test, which I don't know if you saw, Sir Richard Branson actually uh, brought that to our attention on all the various medias as well. Yeah, well, uh, it's just uh, 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 expanding the envelope. Uh, Spaceship 2 is probably going to be the first uh, commercial uh, craft to take people to outer space uh, on a passenger basis and they had one test in April uh, they went up to, to 50,000 some feet and and this latest test goes up to 60 some thousand feet and so gradually you build up until you're actually flying into space and this time they tested uh, what they call the shuttlecock system for uh, making a carefree re-entry. The wings kind of uh, angle so that it breaks the descent as the, as the spaceship comes through the atmosphere again and then the wings level out and they can land and so they went through the whole program for the first time and that's pretty neat. So uh, Branson is saying 2014 is going to be the year when people who have bought their tickets, more than 600 of them, will start uh, getting their own trip into space. Take a look at what I'm doing here, Alan. I'm I am wow. full screen screen sharing YouTube while you're talking about it. There it is. I mean, the pictures say it all. What could be cooler than that? Check out the. Uh, uh, if, can you can you fast forward it or go to the part where it starts to actually like uh, go into feather mode, floating back downwards? And the it's going to happen in a second here. Let's see. Oh. Blah, There's blah, Richard. Blah, blah, Richard Branson. <laughs> there. Look there it that. is. That is ingenious. Yeah, it worked for Spaceship One almost 10 years ago, so uh, hopefully it'll work for Spaceship Two as well. Uh, we know the system works, and as long as people are willing to pay $250,000 for a ride, I think uh, we're going to have a space flight industry. Now, I, can the people who are watching this, can they still see the ribbon down below, or is, has, the, uh, has the video full screened now? It's full screened as far as I can tell. Right, but is that what people are seeing when they're watching the, the show from the outside world? 
Is that what you're seeing? I don't know. We're not in the outside world. No, I know. So I'm asking the outside world. <laughs> All right, outside world. Us. I'll comment at once. All right. <laughs> and now I'll turn off the screen share. Cool. Awesome. That's that's fantastic. Come on. Uh, and did did we did we already do this show of hands? Would you who would fly on spaceship two? Sure. Yeah. You bet. Yeah, I, not I me. I think we did, but with the caveat of, will you buy me a ticket? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll buy you a ticket. Now. Yeah, yeah. Donations. yeah. I, will, I yeah. will buy you a ticket, Amy. Deposits are refundable. I would definitely write about it. They like, give me a ride. <laughs> I'll, like, I'll see what I can do to hook that up for you, David. It's only yeah. fair. Um, all right, well, let's talk about... Casey, you wanted to talk about the Europa Clipper mission. Yes. I will do this quick since we have just a few minutes. The Europa yeah. Clipper mission is the reconfigured uh, second design of a uh, way to get to Europa, the icy moon around Jupiter that has that subsurface ocean, to try to discover more about the ocean, to try to scout it for potential landing in the future. Um, and it's a, what's called a, the lowest cost mission they can basically come up with to do this. And so NASA does not want to do this mission for reasons beyond my understanding, beyond most scientists' understanding or the public. NASA is just not interested in doing a mission to Europa. They've been trying to do it for 15 years. The White House has zero budget for it. NASA has no budget for it. And no one within NASA is really fighting that hard. However, one guy in Congress really wants us to go to Europa. And so there's been this trickle, this little bit of funding just going to mission concept studies for years. And they just got a big boost uh, this year. They got $75 million to do more advanced concept studies. They're doing instrument concept studies. They're really narrowing in on this mission. Uh, so when NASA, if NASA said tomorrow, let's go to Europa, they go, okay, and they could cart, start cutting metal tomorrow. They're, they're basically that far along. So they gave an update on this mission concept today, uh, which is instead of orbiting Europa, this mission will just fly by Europa about 45 times making kind of this, they describe it as a Tholian web kind of crisscross uh, number of orbits over uh, yeah, <laughs> over uh, Europa. And you actually get essentially global coverage. You get almost the same amount of science, but you save a lot of mass, you save a lot of money on fuel, and you, you just kind of makes the whole thing a lot easier. So the big issue with, with flying around Jupiter is that the sun's really dim, so how do you power your spacecraft? And usually the answer has been plutonium. You put some plutonium on it, you use a thing called an RTG, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, that converts it into electricity, and you're fine. Uh, that used to be fine, except that uh, NASA has almost no plutonium left. Uh, they haven't made plutonium in 30 years. And so they were developing this new type of engine called an ASRG, which uses a little sterling pump to generate electricity. Uh, they've been working on this for 10 years, and they just recently announced uh, earlier this week that the concept is too risky to put on a mission to Europa. So it's basically either use all the rest of the plutonium that NASA has sitting around on this mission to Europa, or interestingly, use giant solar panels like the Juno mission. So we were talking about nine meter long solar panels, two meters wide, and uh, it's a real possibility that that may be the new norm for going to Jupiter is using giant solar panels. So that was the kind of new Europa mission news this week. They, they've okayed the uh, updating. The uh, plutonium pipeline has been restarted, but it's going to be a couple of years before it actually makes it to the launch pad. That's true. Did they dismantle a bunch of nuclear weapons? Well, the yeah. ones from Mars Curiosity, they, they bought that from the Russians, the plutonium that's in that. So. Yeah, yeah, the uh, the plutonium, it's a slightly different isotope than nuclear weapons. So yeah. weapons use 239, yeah. uh, NASA uses 238. Uh, and they have, you're right, they have started the initial process of creating plutonium. They won't be up to full production until 2019, is what the last <laughs> thing I heard was. And that they uh, will only be producing, at that point, 1.5 kilograms a year, and MMRTG uses about eight. So yeah. they have enough. If you don't have this new ASRG technology, you have enough for maybe one mission a decade to fund with plutonium. So that we're still not out of the woods even with that new uh, plutonium yeah. process, though I don't want to belie how important it is that we're actually making plutonium again. I uh, have a, actually, <laughs> uh, not to miss this chance to promote uh, the society, we have this big article next issue of the Soci uh, Planetary Report coming out in September all about the plutonium restart process, where they are with that in the Department of Energy, what took so long to get it started. It's this crazy story. It's kind of, in a way, hopeful, despite being a little depressing that it took so long to, to get going again. 
I think buying plutonium off the Russians is good on many levels. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Russians actually stopped selling it to us in 2009. Did they? Oh. Been, yeah, yeah. They, they unilaterally pulled out of the decision. They've been doing that since the end of the Cold War. Russia pulled out. They did not give many reasons why. People think they want to use it for their own missions. However, this Chang'e 3 mission going to the moon, which we talked about earlier, is going to use plutonium. They don't so know if China's China. making it or if China... Oh, interesting is buying it from the Russians, yeah, so no one's really sure yet. But yeah, I mean, the more of this plutonium that gets used for space exploration and commercial purposes, the better. <laughs> well, Just tear yeah. down those rockets. Well, the problem is, again, this is plutonium-238. Yeah, it has yeah. no weaponized potential. The plutonium-238 is actually quite benign from a, a weapons point. You can It's dangerous in the sense that if you powderize it and hail it, you'll be bad off. Uh, <laughs> however, standing next to it, you won't. It's actually yeah. not too bad. All right. Well, let's let's move on. We've only got a couple more stories. I want to make it. Uh, so there's going to be a Venus Moon conjunction. Yeah. In other words, quick. Twitter is going to explode with what's that bright star beside the moon? I've never seen it before. Yeah. The the moon just passed new, and it's going to be in the e in the evening sky. You should be able to start picking up the moon. But what's going to be really cool Sunday night? It's going to be within a degree of the bright star Spica in Virgo and Venus. They're going to be all uh, like a triple conjunction. And for some lucky areas. Uh, they're actually going to see an occultation where the moon passes in front. For Southern, South America, Argentina, and Chile at sunset Sunday night, they're going to see Venus get occulted. And for Europe and the Middle East, right before sunset, and I think right at sunset for the Middle East, they're going to see Spica occulted by the moon. The rest of us will just see a very close within one degree pass. So one degree with a low, low power uh, eyepiece in a telescope, you could put... Uh, Venus and the Moon right in one field of view, so it'll definitely be a, it'll be a good photo op to get out Let's there. Let's do You'll that have... on the virtual star party. We should be able to pull that off, right? Uh, somebody from the West Coast, most likely, because if we yeah. if we start at midnight, uh, they'll have set here on the East Coast, but maybe somebody on the West Coast might be able to get Venus and the Moon in the same frame there Sunday night. So that that will be pretty cool. Cool. All right, uh, two more stories. One from Nicole about the corkscrew jet coming from M87. Yes, this is have you got a uh, picture? actually... Should I yeah, get a picture? I do have a picture. Um, so this is from the Hubble Space Telescope, and they're looking at the synchrotron jet coming out of M87. And I'm going to try and screen share and talk at the same time, which is always fun times. Um, so this is one of the few synchrotron jets we get coming out of a supermassive black hole, the center of a galaxy, that we can see in optical light. And so they actually tracked some of these... Um, can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Actually tracked some of these these little knots and, and filaments and bits in the jet as they moved around. Um, and what what confused me about this press release is because they said things like, this is the first time we've seen corkscrew motion in a jet, and this is the first time. No, it's not. Uh, we've seen this with the, the radio jets using very radio long Radio astronomers have seen yeah, this for years. Yeah, the radio astronomy using very long baseline and interferometry before, but however, that probes a different size scale. And so it may be that it's, it's the first time we're seeing it at this size scale. Um, we're still not entirely sure Hang on, I'm going to unscreen share because I need to make motion with my hands. Um, whether it's uh, that the material is actually spiraling out in some way, or if it's coming out of a wide nozzle jet and it's going pew, 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 pew in different directions. Uh, and so that's that's still a big open question. Uh, and so studying these jets, uh, like I said, this is the one good one you can really see with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see it in optical, but using very long baseline interferometry, using these radio telescopes spread across the planet, you can get really fine, really high resolution data and uh, see this because the physics of this is still a bit of a question. But you get these amazing environments around these supermassive black holes. You get these great accretion disks if they're actively feeding. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these supermassive black holes are turning at literally the limits of the speed of light. Yeah. There's these crazy magnetic fields around them and it's spewing out this material that can go millions of light years away from the, yeah. From yeah. the galaxy yeah, these... and, and are thought to maybe help like form new stars and yeah yeah it's pretty intimately connected with galaxy evolution it turns out whether or not um, when a galaxy goes through an active phase it's thought that all galaxies go through an active phase at some point that um, is is intimately tied to uh, the star formation in that galaxy as well as other stuff going on around the galaxy so segways. Jason, <laughs> segue I know segue Jason <laughs> There is some limit, though, to this growth. 
Yes, I mean, uh, one of the questions is why, uh, why don't some galaxies, or why don't all galaxies, why aren't they bigger? Why don't they have more stars? Um, uh, they, you know, astronomers look at uh, these distant galaxies and they say, well, you know, what stops them? What makes them have a, as many stars as we see and not more than that? And the answer may actually be the supermassive black holes that are sitting in the center of most, if not all, of these galaxies. So the jets that are coming out, uh, like Nicole mentioned, um, these jets actually can can slurp up some of the gas and cold dust that that's in the galactic nucleus and blow it right out of the neighborhood. You know, so along with the jets that are that are blasting out of there, they're actually just you know taking some of this potential star forming material and shooting it right out of the galaxy. Meaning you're not going to get any stars out of that material. Um, and this is findings uh, based on some research by a, a, a worldwide team of a, a radio astronomers. So they were looking at a galaxy 4C12. Dot 50, and that is uh, about 1.5 billion miles away. I actually have a uh, an overlay here if I can turn it on and see if it comes up. But anyway, um, so what they found is is that you know uh, th one of these one of these relativistic jets is just pushing a huge cloud of uh, of gas and dust, and it's just basically plowing it out out of the galaxy, out of the uh, the, the central part. Um, so. You know that's one way the galaxies can lose dust, and it's kind of like a uh, galactic birth control, really. I mean, you know, no no star formation will be forming out of out of that material. Very cool. I tried one to put last... the picture up, but it did, but it didn't come up. Yeah, somewhere. I was trying to find it too, but I I was was sort of taking too long. Um, ooh, so ooh, 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 Amy, ooh. <laughs> Amy's your title. Yeah. Picture. Oh, oh, you got it. Okay, you got a picture. picture. Yeah, I mean, oh, cool. you know, it's it's uh. It's not, you know, it's not a super pretty picture, except that yeah, maybe... Radio yeah, shut up, contours are awesome. Excited. Yeah, maybe Nicole would be excited about that, being all radio astronomy and stuff. But yeah, that's... <laughs> what, our plots that, are awesome. Yep. We love blobs. So that blob, that orange blob, that reddish-orange blob, is the cloud of gas that's getting plowed out of the center of uh, galaxy 4C12.50 um, by the jet that's in there. Amazing. Yep. All right, so last thing. Uh, Amy, I found this fake picture... Check it out. <laughs> it's not a fake picture. Everyone is getting really mad at me saying that I put up a fake picture. This is the Apollo 7 launch, which was on October 11th, 1968, and it's not fake. Um, this picture was taken from somebody sitting in a C-135 aircraft, which is flying at 35,000 feet-ish um, over the ocean, which, and we don't normally see launches, especially, I mean, you know, Apollo era launches from this perspective, which is why it looks like it's launching from directly next to the VAB, and the VAB looks really wonky and strange. Um, it's just a weird, <laughs> weird angle for a picture, because usually we see them with the water in the background, or, you know, nothing around it. Um, so yeah, here's Apollo 7 launching. That's wild. I've never seen that. I yeah, love no, this picture. <laughs> I, I'd never seen this picture either. Yeah, I saw it right away. I'm like, that is so great. You can see, you can just tell by the, by because there's so little depth of field, I'm also using hand gestures that you can't see, um, there's so little depth of field that had to have been taken from really <laughs> far away with a really yeah. long telephoto lens. It looks lens. like it's launch, yes. launching out of the VAB. It looks like it's launching <laughs> out of the VAB. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it just exactly. looks like Someone who doesn't understand how perspective works drew the VAB and then pasted a rocket on top of it. <laughs> shopped. Shopped. Yeah. Shopped. Yeah. But real yeah. picture, because, you know, it was 1968 and they didn't have fancy. Uh, this is not fancy photoshopping, but... <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, but well, I... And Apollo 7, that was the last unmanned Apollo launch, correct? No, that was the first manned Apollo launch. Oh, it was the first manned launch, okay. Yeah, first one after. But they didn't go to the They, they did didn't not. They, the they didn't have a lunar module. They had the first Block 2 uh, CSM, and they just took it into Earth orbit for 11 days. Amy, can cool. you send a link, a link to that picture? <laughs> so I can um, figure it out. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Oh, I can. Faster. <laughs> totally racing you. Racing link race. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I had to find it to find your picture, so that's why I had Fair. it ready to go. Okay. Fair. Um, Amy won that, by the way. Oh! <laughs> uh. All right. Well, then let's wrap this up. 
I'm done with you people. Um, <laughs> Shut, we love you. <laughs> so first, I want to thank uh, Eric for joining us this week and uh, his trial by fire. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and bringing that, that cool interview. And uh, I will put you in the circle, the notification circle. And uh, anytime you want to come back and uh, mention some articles that you're working on, we'd love to, we'd t- love to have you join us. You're maybe muted. Where can people find more about you? Uh, you can Google Sagai, S-C-I-G-Y. Um, or Is that what you are on Twitter? Uh, Kron Sagai. So yeah, Kron, C-H-R-O-N, Sagai. Perfect. Thanks for uh, having me. I enjoyed it. And you've also got your, you've got a blog too, right? So, I mean, not yeah, just yeah. The, the Chronicle, mm-hmm. but you also have your separate blog. Yeah, I put the full interview up on the, my blog. So okay, I'll great. Um, in the future, feel free to put your Twitter handle. You'll see that a lot of the other people here like to do that. Okay. <laughs> we all hang out on Twitter. When We're we tacky working, like that. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Alan Boyle, where do we find out more? Okay, it can. the easy way is cosmiclog.com. Uh, that's on NB- NBCnews.com. And Twitter is B0YLE. Perfect. Amy Short Title, where do we find out more? Uh, you can follow me at Google Plus and on Facebook as my name, on Twitter at, as uh, AST Vintage Space, and um, my, my blog and all my, my stuff is generally aggregated at amyshiratitle.com. So, yay. Yay. Casey. Uh, planetary.org for all of the stuff that I do and all of my colleagues at Explore Planets on Twitter uh, for all the stuff I run that, but it's the Society's official feed. And I need to plug real quick, uh, we're doing a live webcast tonight starting one hour before Laddie's lunch, so 7.30 p.m. Pacific, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, lunar scientist, other guests coming in, live video from people at Wallops. Uh, check us out at planetary.org to watch that. And Alan, I was so disappointed you did not list that in your Cosmic Log uh, post today about how to watch the Laddie lunch. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll fix that. Heartbreak, yeah. <laughs> I already have a link in. in the comments. So. We will, and we will there. cut to NASA TV to watch the launch altogether. So you watch us, you watch the launch at the same time. There uh, planetary.org, so catch us there. Uh, Thanks, Alan. And so, right, and so the point is, like, it's not going to be a hangout, it's going to be your own... That's a real, we're, it's going to be a live event in front of 150 people here in Pasadena. We have real cam- multiple cameras, um, it's on live stream, so a level up from the usual hangout. Right. Uh, hosts, guests, interviews, contests, all the good stuff. And with a launch, sounds with great. With a launch, just thrown in, we worked it out with NASA. So That's free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. David. Uh, see, this week I was active on Universe Today, my own site, AstroGuys, Listasaur.com, Canada.com, and I will be tweeting as at, at AstroGuys with the Z tonight about 20, about 9 p.m. when NASA TV goes live with the Laddie launch. I'll be tweeting all about Laddie and covering it. So, Great. That sounds like when Amy mentions the places she's writing. Um, that was good today. Yeah. <laughs> Jason Major. I'm at lightsinthedark.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at JP Major uh, and Read Universe Today and Discovery Space News. Perfect. That reminds me, Ian O'Neill should come back. All right, Nicole Gallucci. Seriously, Ian, what the what the deuce? Uh, <laughs> hi everyone. I'm my brain's still in Atlanta. I'm Nicole Gallucci, noisy astronomer for CosmoQuest. I have two quick things I want to plug. Uh, first of all, I mentioned this briefly uh, at the very beginning, so Matthew Francis and, and I are part of this big thing called the DIY Science Zone at Geek Girl Con. We're currently raising money uh, to get a bunch more scientists and science communicators out to Geek Girl Con in Seattle to do science with con-goers. Um, and we have a bunch of really ridiculous um, funding um, like like levels, uh, where uh, one of them is where uh, is where uh, Matthew will wear a Cthulhu hat in public for every hundred dollars raised. Uh, Doctor Rubidium will uh, listen to uh, a Nickelback album for every certain amount raised. She <laughs> hates Nickelback, so that's that's kind of amusing. Uh, I will be doing Mad Lib science abstracts if we hit I think for every thousand dollars raised. So uh, I'll be doing a hangout on that. Um, I'll put the link in there, but if you Google DIY Science Zone Geek Girl Con, you'll you'll get that. Um, when is second, the Geek Girl Con? October nineteenth and twentieth in Seattle. So mm. I'll be there. Um, the, I am 
already funded to go, so I am not part of this. This I am not part of the uh, recipient of this money. I am just pushing this hard so that some of the other people can go. Uh, so it's a pretty cool event, uh, and we're hoping to expand that to more cons as well. Um, we'll see how that goes. Other thing, I'm going to totally shamelessly plug. I'm doing a 5K tomorrow for the Be the Match um, B- Bone Marrow Donation Registry. So uh, if you look on my Google Plus page or on Twitter, you'll see a link where you can uh, donate to their organization. Uh, and if I reach my funding goal t- by tomorrow morning, I will post a really ridiculous video of me trying to run because I'm very not athletic, and it'll be very funny. So check that out. <laughs> Raise all the monies. Thanks. Great. Um, I'm trying to think if I have anything to plug. No, you've all plugged it already. Um, but make sure you subscribe to this channel on YouTube if you're watching this. Wherever you're seeing this, make sure you subscribe. That way you'll get reminders, and it'll pop up in your YouTube feeds, and that's the best way to enjoy this YouTube. Um, well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Wow, big crew. Uh, I love it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for watching, and uh, we will see all of you next week. The next thing is going to be the virtual star party on Sunday night, where we may try to get this conjunction happening, which will be great. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Mm